In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The text for our consideration this evening is the Gospel lesson which was just read. This week marks the end of our Lenten journey. The Holy Spirit has led us through Christ's passion, showing us how he bears our sins on himself to the cross. Christ carries those sins which surround him, whether it be spiritual laxity, denial, deliberate sins, or false expectations, like we learned last week. But there is one more, even more important sin to consider, one which lies at the base of them all, unbelief. The crowd surrounding Jesus at his crucifixion certainly didn't believe in him. After all, if they did, they would not be mocking him in this way. As the text for tonight points out, some of those who stood there when they heard him said, this man is calling for Elijah. Now, this might seem a little puzzling to us, but consider this. No Jew would misunderstand the meaning of the word Eli. That's Hebrew for my God. Sure, Eli forms the first part of Eliyahu, the Hebrew for the man we call Elijah. But hearing Eli and saying Eliyahu is putting words into the mouth of Christ. They are deliberately twisting his words to mock him even more. And their reason for doing so is clear in the text. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. They think that by calling for Elijah, he's really showing his despair and seeking aid from somewhere else. And since Elijah was prophesied to come before the coming of Christ, and Elijah did come in John the Baptist, they are also denying that he is the Messiah. If Elijah hasn't come, since they also rejected John the Baptist, then how can this man be Christ? What is this other than gross unbelief? The crowd twists the word of God to fit their preconceived notions and denies the divinity of Christ in the same breath. However, this is also your and my problem. Now, certainly, you and I have been baptized into Christ. You have been given faith. You would not be here tonight otherwise, hearing the word of God. Your struggles with unbelief are different from those who are ruled by it. You and I fight against it rather than give in to it. But the problem, nevertheless, has the same character. Sin is still sin. God doesn't turn a blind eye to your sin. And where do all sins come from but from unbelief? This is what the church means when she speaks about the old Adam. Your natural self, the nature which you have according to your physical birth, is a complete pagan. Your old Adam will never believe in God. He isn't reformed or renewed or improved. Your old Adam has to be killed. Now, where is the proof of this? Why do you, Christian, still sin if you believe in God? Where does sin come from if not from your old sinful nature? Why do you gossip, lie, turn a blind eye to sin, and so on, if you've been baptized and reborn through the waters of holy baptism. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Paul makes this perfectly clear when he says, I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. If you and I were truly free from sin, we would no longer sin. But as the old Adam, your sinful flesh remains, so also remains this unbelief. All sins, thinking the worst of others, 
self-righteousness, slander, lust, envy, and many more flow from a polluted heart. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. One character in this whole story of the Passion shows us this clearly. The centurion who guarded Christ was without doubt the worst kind of pagan. Born in the Roman Empire and serving in the Roman military, this man's life was characterized by unbelief of the worst kind. Worshiping false idols and engaging in the worst kinds of moral practices was quite normal for Roman men like him. And scripture testifies that the Roman soldiers who crucified Christ also mocked him as much as the crowd. But now there's a change. This centurion witnesses all of the events which happened right after the death of Christ. He saw the earthquake and saw the splitting rocks. He saw the heavens darkened and heard the cry of Christ. And what does he say, having witnessed all of this? Truly, this was the Son of God. Here is the cry of true faith. Christ has given this centurion faith in him, and the centurion makes a true confession. His unbelief has been covered over by Christ, and faith has now been kindled within him. And this is also true for you, dear Christians. Your old Adam, your old sinful and unbelieving nature, has been covered by Christ in your baptism. Christ has clothed you with himself in those holy waters. Your guilt has been taken away. You now have faith in him, and Christ is also now cutting off your sin from you through his holy word and sacraments. But note especially where this is happening. Note where the centurion makes his confession of faith, at the foot of the cross looking at the dead Christ. Christ hangs dead for the sins of the whole world. Christ has also carried the sin of unbelief on himself, and he now pays the penalty for it there in his death. No one in the story up until this point has got it un right and understood what Christ was doing. The centurion is the first one. He recognizes that his sin has been taken away by the death of Christ there on the cross. And Christ has also carried your sins on himself and died for you. His death is the end of the reign of Satan and sin. The paschal lamb, the sin-bearing lamb of God, has been sacrificed on the cross for you. And so now, this Lenten journey comes to an end. All of your sins have been carried to the cross. The disciples showed you the result of spiritual laxity, but Christ faithfully carried them. Peter showed you the result of denying Christ, actively or passively, but Christ made the good confession in his death. Pilate showed you the result of knowing the truth and sinning anyway, but Christ did what is right and by suffering and dying on the cross. And the thief on the cross in the crowd showed you the result of false expectations of God, but Christ died in weakness in order to conquer sin and death. And finally, the centurion shows you the result of unbelief. But Christ gave him faith to recognize him in the cross, just as he has also given you faith to recognize him as he is, as true God and true man. Christ is the true sin-bearer of the world, and he has carried your sins on himself. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, 
keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.